That's a great future looking question for lawyers. Uh, you can go on chat GPT right now and yeah. for $20 a month, you can get spectacular good legal advice. Like right now, it, it, I don't know if I would trust it hundred percent because of hallucinations, but there's a lot of really good information out there available to people. So we've been looking at that and asking ourselves as lawyers, how do we add value? Because if we don't figure out that construct of what are we doing to add value to people and their ability to maximize justice, then we'll be out of business in five years. I mean, like I, I, I see a lot of people running into the wall in the next five years. They'll have to figure out something else to do to add value in people's lives. And we've come down on a couple of things. Number one, uh, our core values are fight to win, passion to serve, own it, and relentless innovation. So that last core value is the one that we all struggle with the most because it's this insanely fast, ever-changing landscape of technology. And we were talking about it last night. Like, are we at a unique point in history with the speed at which the world has changed, right? So when I think about leadership, I think about, you know, a lot of different people that I've I've worked with. I think about, you know, the great authors like Maxwell and and there's just a lot of great people in politics and entertainment that I look up to. But then the people that I have worked with, my most important clients and of course people that have been on my staff over the years are are really the people that have had the biggest impact in uh, what I do every day in my business. And one of those people, I have them on the podcast today. You know, for those of you that listen to the Lead Gen HQ podcast, we're typically talking about lead generation, not so much leadership, but it came to, to, to my mind one day that really in order for you to succeed in, in business, you have to generate leads consistently. And I started to go through the list of names of different clients we've worked with in the past 15 years. And no doubt, Brian Lebovic's name came up because here is a, a, a leader who runs a mid-sized law firm with uh, lots of employee staff, uh, but he makes the time to understand the importance of lead generation. So we felt for this segment uh, that we're calling Leaders in Business, Brian Lebovic from the Lebovic Law Group would be the perfect guest for today's show. So welcome to the podcast, Brian. What an introduction. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Alex. That was crazy. That was way too much credit, but thank you. Mm -hmm. That's so nice of you. It's such a nice compliment coming from such a smart business person in our community as well. I appreciate that. But I, I genuinely mean that, you know, we don't always get to do the on-premise meetings. And before COVID, when we started to work back in 2020 and we'd come out to your office, I mean, you were very hands-on. You didn't have to be in those meetings. You have a robust staff, but you were in every meeting, very hands-on with your staff, with your clients. And to me, that is like the, you know, picture of leadership. What I think about a leader is the ones who get their hands dirty and you certainly do in every aspect of your business. So my first question for you today is, what do you believe is the most important quality in a leader in the legal field? And how has this quality played a role in your firm's success and client satisfaction? Wow, what a hard question. The most important quality as a leader in the legal field. So in the legal field itself, uh, the, the leadership for me is recognizing where you stand in the community of the law and making sure that you're doing something as a, as a business, as a service that has value to our community because the law has kind of a hard reputation. So in the legal industry, my, my thought as a leader is to make sure that whatever you're doing as a lawyer for the community, that you're leading a very mission-driven, community-driven, you know, getting some good in the world done driven mission, right? So I think there's just a lot of, of lawyers out there that are perceived as only being involved in their craft for money, right? Like I, I went into being a law because it makes a lot of money. And there, I think that maybe there's a lot of lawyers that are like that. As a leader in the law, I see that as being a failing proposition. And I think that as a leader, we have to be very mission driven. We have to look at our community and say, this is a segment I want to help, whatever that is, whether it's a business segment, 
or the immigrant segment or the criminal segment or the, you know, the, the, the person who needs a consumer justice prosecutor, which is what we are, right? Like people that help people that have civil damages that need to bring them to justice. You have to be very mission driven. So that's as the, the community legal leader, right? As the leader of a law firm, right? Who has created that sense of mission and created a sense of core value adherence. I think that the, the key is probably to be unyielding in that mission and in that core value uh, analysis for your team and to be very communicative on the importance of keeping people moving toward that mission. And it's not only important for you as a leader for your business to move the, the, the firm forward, but it's important for the mission to complete for the community at large itself. So it's all kind of all based around mission and, and core values, I think. Well, and I, I can say, you know, to our listeners here who may, may not know the Lebovic Law Group, because we have listeners all over the world. I had the honor of working with you and your team for years and going in there and working with different people on your staff, that, that mission and that mentality of the warrior for justice and how to treat clients uh, was very, very like front and center. So Obviously, again, it highlights the fact that it starts from the top down and then you have to illustrate that day in and day out. And you certainly do that. Now, in terms of um, a story that I remember you talking about from when you really thought of going into the legal field was a story about your a ticket that you got in high school. Tell us about that story, Brian. That's such a it's so funny that you remember that story. That's awesome. All right. So the story revolves around why I wanted to become a trial lawyer. So. When I was going through high school, I had a good friend of mine. His name is Ari Sofer. He's now Dr. Ari Sofer, and he's still one of my best friends. He's got a spectacularly good practice, medical practice in Broward and uh, Dade County. Um, and when we were growing up, Ari had convinced me that we were going to be doctors together. Like, that's what we had to be. So I'm involved in taking every AP chemistry, physiology, biology course I can in high school to prepare myself to get good grades in, in undergrad to go to medical school, which is impossible to get into. You know, so I thought, you know, like I really had to prep for it. And I ended up going to the gym. I wrestled in high school. And so I'd go to the gym every day. And I had this great gym downtown that I wanted to go to. I drove forever to get there called Gold's Gym. There's a natural chain, Gold's Gym. But it was kind of like, we're the real muscle heads that like worked out. So I, I loved being that in high school. And I would drive down there. And believe it or not, in high school, I had a giant, you know, afro of hair on top of my head. And I wore a bandana <laughs> tied around my head, like, you know. Like I came from some, you know, Hispanic neighborhood in inner city, New York, even though I was from Dayton, Ohio. Um, and, and so I, I kind of looked like a hood, right? So I, I'd go down to, to downtown Dayton and I'd work out at Gold's Gym and then we'd get home and then I'd drive home, right? And when I drove home, I'd have to come out of Gold's Gym and their back alley and make a left turn on, a, on kind of a downtown street. It was right in downtown Dayton, which was a almost a ghost town at that time because Dayton is a destroyed economy, right? So, and then I was going to make a right turn on red. And in, in Ohio, there was a right turn on red, right? So here I am, this 17-year-old kid, and I had borrowed my mom's car. So I had a nicer car than I probably should have been in with this kind of look, right? And so I started to make the right turn. And then I noticed there was a sign that said, no right turn on red. So I ended up backing up, right? And I ended up doing that. And then a couple of cops pulled beside me and they ended up giving me a ticket for right turn on red, even though I didn't make the right turn on red. And the only reason they pulled me over was to probably just to make sure I didn't steal the car. You know, like that was probably the real reason. Profiling. I kind of don't blame them, you know, but they ended up giving me the ticket for right turn on red. So I disputed that ticket and I went into court. And when I was sitting there in court, um, this woman came up to me and said, hi, Brian, I'm so-and-so and I'm the prosecuting attorney. And I was with my mom and I was like, cause I brought my mom to court and here I was like dressed like nicer than I am today with you. And, 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 you know, like I'm, I look at her, I'm like, there's a prosecuting attorney. I could go to jail. Like, oh my God, like we need a lawyer. We need to get a lawyer. And my mom is like, we're not getting a lawyer. There's, there's no way like, sorry, you're gonna have to defend yourself today. I was like, okay. So I walk into court and the prosecutor, you know, the judge says, hello, she, you know, and the prosecutor, she says, okay, let's let's start with opening statements. You know, like, go ahead, Mrs. Prosecutor, because she gets to go first. And uh, and I said, she started talking. It was wrong. Like, her story was wrong. 
And I was like, judge, no, I object. This is wrong. Like she doesn't understand what happened. But, and the judge is like, sit down. You'll get your chance to talk. You'll get an opening, but you got to listen to her and she can say whatever she wants right now. So just relax. So I sit back down. She tells her story. She's like, now you say it. So tell me your story. So then I tell her what happened. You know, like, no, this isn't what happened. Blah, 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 blah. And I clearly like to tell a story. So you've heard, right? So I tell her the story. I turn around. Okay. So now she understands everybody's facts. She calls the first officer. He starts to talk. He doesn't remember what happened. And I don't blame him. Like, there's a gazillion tickets. Like, at the time, I think I'm being, like, criminal number one, and everybody should know my story. This cop gave me a ticket, like, five months ago. Now I finally have a court date. He's forgotten all about it. He doesn't remember me. He doesn't know what I look like. Like, like there's no way he remembers anything about this stupid traffic ticket. But I don't know that as a kid. So I'm incensed that he doesn't know the facts of my accident. I'm like objection your honor this is wrong he's not telling the truth and you know like and she's like sit down you'll have a chance to cross-examine him and i was like fine so i get a pad of paper out and i start writing questions down as he's testifying on what i wanted to ask him about so i just scribbled my cross-examination down on a pad of paper and i got up and i was like I don't know, like, you know, the spirit of Effley Bailey took over me or something. And I like cross-examined the hell out of this poor guy. And I was like, isn't it true that you did this? And isn't it true that you did that? And I, isn't it true that you went here and here and here? And no, that's not what you said. You said this, didn't you? And then you did this and then you did it. And I cross-examined to the guy. The cop was like, yeah, I think you're right. I think the sign is out of place. The no right on red sign is out of place. I was like, okay. So I was like, I guess that's good. So I like sat down, the, the, the prosecutor was like, what just happened? You know, he leaves, he had a partner in the car with him. They actually called a second cop. He got up, I cross-examined him, made him look stupid as well. And I was like, would you think that if he did this? And he said like, he didn't know anything about the ticket. He couldn't remember it. He leaves, we did our closing statements. I probably was like, see your honor, I was right. And blah, blah, blah. And case ends and she looks at the prosecutor and she goes i think there's reasonable doubt here so i'm going to find him not guilty wow. mr Lebeau, i want you and your mom to come back into chambers with me so the judge brings me back to chambers and she says hey you're in high school what are you going to do when you go to college and i was like i'm studying to be a doctor i'm going to be a doctor and she goes oh no oh no you're going to be a trial i see people come in day in and day out professional lawyers mm -hmm. prosecutors defense lawyers the capacity to cross-examine someone like you just did is an innate skill that doesn't come along often. I don't see it along that often. He goes, you've got that skill. You need to be a trial lawyer. You're, you're born to be a trial lawyer, my friend. And from that moment forward, my path was set. Like, it felt so good in that courtroom. It felt so good when I was doing it. It felt so natural, so, like, right place for me. I was so... Like once I was there and I finally realized when I could talk and when I couldn't talk, it was just such a fun, comfortable experience, so exhilarating that I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So and I I've love never that. I, I love that story. And I think it embodies, Brian, I think it embodies um, what you've talked about over the years with, with, I mean, not just us, but what you guys put out there in terms of your content on the website, social media, which is this model of the warrior for justice, which I know for some people listening, they may look at it and say, well, it, it's just another law firm tagline, but I can tell you that it's not a, just a tagline because you, you tie into this story that you just told about punching back uh, at, at the bullies, which in this case, sometimes the law can be a bully because if they get it wrong and you don't fight back, guess what? You lose, right? So thinking about that warrior for justice uh, uh, mentality that you have, that you kind of developed so early, how, how does that mentality help you shape your approach to business? So, yeah, um, you know, I grew up in, in a place that was a little inhospitable. And so I, I had a lot of bully experiences when I was young. Um, started with one particular bully story that my dad made me go out and fight a bully and fist, fist fight. He made me go outside and have a fist fight with a kid as a young person um, who was bullying me. And that led to my ability to um, recognize that winning the fight isn't about actually winning the fight. Winning the fight is about winning respect. Um, and that as you win respect, you can, you can win people over and you can, you can 
get a lot of good things done, you know, by, by just putting, bringing the fight, just bring the fight as best you can. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, my father was an insurance agent and, uh, his great pleasure was to sell to moderate income people. I mean, my dad's clientele was not upper income, big life people like, you know, millionaires. He sold to farmers and plumbers and like, this is who he sold, um, retirement planning systems and in case somebody died systems that would save a family if the breadwinner died right and there's nothing that bothered me so much as when my father came home upset that mm -hmm. he had sold a policy to someone and god forbid something happened something did happen like somebody would die right and then the insurance company wouldn't pay that claim based on a technicality or an error or a failing in the insurance application, which fell to my dad because he would ask these people about their histories or something and they would leave something out or they wouldn't tell him something and he, he would feel responsible that he didn't dig, dig deep enough and he gave it out to the, you know, like it just bothered him to no end. And I realized very early that the insurance companies were this amoral, uncaring, I mean, the, the concept that like a good neighbor, State Farm is there is such a, a propagandist, wrong headed. I mean, State Farm is there if the contract is unavoidably payable, but if it's avoidably payable, they will not be there for you. That is my right. guarantee to you. And I grew up with that in my head that these insurance companies were awful to people. And so I grew up with this real dislike. And I, I recognize as an adult person that insurance has a has a, a wonderful role to play in society. Right. But I just, I know the rules, right? And the rules are, you better get it right or else we're not gonna pay you, right? The contract is the contract and it's nothing human at all. It's a contract. And if you're not in the four walls of that and we can escape it, they will escape it. And I see it every day when people try to kill policies, when they do sneaky things to people. Here's, this just happened. This happened last week. This is a true story, right? A guy switches his insurance company, right? And he switches it to from company A to company B. I'm not going to give you the companies, but he switched it to company B. Company B had him sign all the contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And his daughters, two days later, two days. So on the, the 5th of January, they signed a contract. On the 7th of January, three of his four girls were driving north into Florida because they were going up to college to deliver one of the girls to college and to hang out and party for a couple of days and then she'll start class. So this just happened. And while they were going up there, a giant truck hit the car, spun it out, wow. giant accident, big problem, right? And two days later, after reporting the claim, luckily his girls are okay. They, 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 they were okay. I mean, they're hurt, but they're not you know, gonna die or anything. So two days later, the insurance company sends him another form which he doesn't understand and they they put in a note uh we need this for your insurance policy just to complete the application right and they had him sign a rejection of uninsured motorist coverage so after the accident they tried to get him to sign an uninsured motorist coverage thing and when we the lawyers got into it three weeks later because you know he made sure his things and we we ended up getting the call three weeks later so we just got in place and we, we sent it and we asked them, does he have UM? They were like, oh, no, he, he rejected it. And their position is, oh, no, no, no. He meant to reject it. We think he meant to reject it on the first day. We're not going to give him coverage. And they're fighting us on coverage. Wow. So it's that type of thing, that dirty, like, really? You're doing that after the accident? Just because it was a recent policy? Like, I'm sorry, if you didn't get your rejection signed on day one and he got an accident on day two, then until he signs that, I don't. Okay, fine. Like from this point forward, he can reject it. But when his daughters were hurt, that's covered. So we're wow. having that fight now, and I'm going to win that fight. Well, I'm I'm sure you will because you you're you're fighting for them. But uh, Brian, talk to me about that. Then you know. So in the case that someone needs an attorney, I mean, there's lot lots of options out there. I I really liked a few years back when you wrote a book that gives the play-by-play -play for people who want to basically 
be the Brian when Brian was a 17 fighting for his own case. You kind of wrote out this blueprint, which I thought from a marketing standpoint, what are you doing, Brian? This is like, this is your business. You're showing people how to do it. But at the end of the day, I think we all know most people want to pay to get a job done, not do it themselves. And there's always going to be a small number of people who'd rather research it and and, and be that Brian at 17. So tell us about the book. Why, why really did you do the book? So I did the book because I had a guy who called me in the middle of his case. He was literally litigating his own case. And he said, hey, uh, my, he had a, we had a mutual friend and he said, he said he would, you would talk me through helping me out. I'm just don't know where to go with this case this is what I'm doing. He was doing his own case. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And so I coached him through that whole case and he ended up getting a nice settlement on that case. Right. Um, and when I was doing that, he was like, you know, you're great at coaching this stuff and you clearly don't worry about, you know. The business end of it with me you've been really nice why don't you write a book about that and just help people out who don't want to do this and i thought all right let's do that that sounds like fun I, i've always wanted to write a book i didn't know what to write about because you know like what am i going to write about so i thought well i write about what i know right and what i know is how to get your injury case covered from day one through day final right and so i kind of put it all out there in the book there's a lot of people and it's all allegorical it's all stories it's easy to read it gives a lot of examples um, it, it has forms attached to it so that if you go to the website, we have forms attached to it. So you can, you can pick up your own forms and you're, I'm happy to help you do your own case. There are a segment of the population that want to do their own case. Almost all of those cases are small cases, right? Honestly, small cases are lost leaders for law firms. I mean, when you've got a small case that settles for under $25,000 for us, that fee is $8,300, which sounds like a ton of money, but we pay lawyers, we pay paralegals, we pay staff, we pay our advertising. Like it's very expensive to run these cases. The profit margin on that case is not huge. So allowing those, we've got we've got more, luckily, knock on wood, right? We've got more cases than we can handle. We refer out, I mean, I, pr I probably referred out more than 2000 cases last year, um, yeah. just because we it's impossible to do every case. So we like to investigate our case as well. Everything that falls in our bailiwick, which is pretty much all auto accidents that have coverage that are, mm -hmm. are viable, we will help people get to a settlement. Um, the smaller cases, if you want us to handle them, that's because you've got a situation where the policy is in such a way that your medical bills and your lost wages and all of that will overwhelm the cost of the entire settlement. And so you need a lawyer to kind of negotiate out everything for you. So while we'll get the money quickly, you're you're going to be left with debt if we don't get you out of all of that, right? So we try to keep our clients so that no matter what, at the end of the case, they're in a better place than they would have been without us, right? That's the, if we can't get there, then we'll give you the case and say, we can't help you on this case. Like we can't get you to a better place. The, the goal is always to add more value than we take in, in, a, in a fee, right? right? And that's the same as a medical billing company. Like the goal is that you're always taking a case on where the person that you're going to help gets more value out of your service than the cost of getting that service. So that's that's kind of where we fall on that. But in the bigger cases, the ones that are really truly, you know, detrimental to people where that's it's big money damages, you get so much more getting a lawyer that paying the legal fee is overwhelmed by the amount of return on that investment. Mm -hmm. So you invest in having a law firm do it for you. And if you did it alone, the insurance company would only give you X. Getting a law firm would give you Y. Um, with the average law firm, that's a three or a four multiple. So that if you can get ten thousand, we'll get forty thousand. But with a really good aggressive law firm, which I, I'm like, look, there's a lot of average law firms out there. But if we can be the exceptional aggressive warrior for justice, getting maximum. So our our you know, our mission is to maximize justice by aggressively fighting for our clients' rights. All those words were chosen on purpose, very carefully chosen, you know, maximizing justice, aggressively fighting, right? All of that concept is who we want to be. So I think that honestly, if you can get 10, I can get six over that. Like I'll get six times on your 10,000, I'll get 60, not 40 or 30, which is the average law firm. We'll get more than the average law firm. That's our, our mantra, our goal, our, our mission is to get you, you know, maybe 10, maybe 10 times multiple on what you would get as a, as an individual. So you can take the book, 
you can run with it. You can get a settlement. You can do what you want with it. I'm very happy to help people if that's where they want to be. Just this morning, I had a, a buddy of mine. He's had an auto accident. He doesn't really want to do a whole lot with it. He's like, look, I'm not looking to make a million dollars on this. I need treatment. I need to be covered. I don't want to get it settled out. And, I, and I've and i called him like five times on it to give him advice. And I'm not looking to bring him in and tell him he's got to be a client and do all that. It's It won't be worth it for him or I. In the long run, he's going to probably take $3,500 and get it settled. I mean, like me being involved in that is silly. So I just love that approach because for those, those who listen to the podcast here, we talk about marketing lead gen. That is like the ultimate lead magnet. It a, shows that you're a thought leader, but also shows that, you know, look, you're not in it just for the money, you know? And so I, I totally agree with your approach in that you have to do something that's bigger than, than just the transactions that, that, that we do in business. And I think the book does that, Brian. So leading into like, you, you're always on the cutting edge of everything. I see like the interactive maps and guides that you guys put on the website. I know we did a bunch of videos with you guys and the guys from uh, Brian, the other Brian uh, video company. So I'll give them a shout out here on the podcast because they do great video. Yeah. And so you guys have always been like great, really great students. And I really want to highlight that for those, um, CEOs and, and leaders who are listening to the podcast in that, you know, when you hire a marketing company, it's a two-way street. They can only be as good as you are to them. Meaning you always had people on your staff, whether it was Maria or Paula or anybody there to assist us in getting you guys to the next level. And that's not the case for a lot of businesses, right? Most businesses, they, they hire a marketing agency or a marketer and say, Hey, Go do the magic, except there is no magic. It's just a lot of hard work to get it done. You guys are always on the cutting edge of everything. What do you think about how you guys are going to use AI to basically do what you guys do in the book, but not take away those big cases from you guys? So that's, that's, that's a great question. That's a great future looking question for lawyers. Uh, you can go on chat GPT right now and yeah. for $20 a month, you can get spectacular good legal advice like right now it, it i don't know if i would trust it 100 percent because of hallucinations but there's a lot of really good information out there available to people so we've been looking at that and asking ourselves as lawyers how do we add value because if we don't figure out that construct of what are we doing to add value to people and their ability to maximize justice then we'll be out of business in five years. I mean, like I, I, I see a lot of people running into the wall in the next five years. They'll have to figure out something else to do to add value in people's lives. And we've come down on a couple of things. Number one, uh, our core values are fight to win, passion to serve, own it, and relentless innovation. So that last core value is the one that we all struggle with the most because it's this insanely fast, ever-changing landscape of technology. And we were talking about it last night. Like, are we at a unique point in history with the speed at which the world has changed, right? We see unrest in the world, like in a way that I don't think we've seen since no. right before World War II, probably, or yeah. World War I, which was kind of like World War I and II, or a blend. But like, there was that industrial change in the world this shrinking of the world, this flattening of the world, as Tom Friedman puts it, the world is flat. Like all of that coming together with the web, coming together with social, coming together with billions of people, coming together with TikTok and, and propaganda. And like, we've got this crazy moment in the world. Now we've got AI being put on top of that. Um, so we, we've got a, a, I think, I think we've got a unique moment because while other revolutions of society, the Industrial Revolution, the Gutenberg Press, they changed society slowly. You know, like Rome changed society with being able to communicate through all these, you know, roads lead to Rome. Like they had this network of roads that they could send chariots out very quickly and get messages out to the world. Papyrus changed the world, right? But it, it changed it really slowly. Like over the course of like 400 years, they built the roads, right? And then we had the Gutenberg Press and then we started printing press, right? So that changed the world over what? Like maybe... 200 years, like when books finally got into the society, right? And then we had, you know, the internet come in and now, now, we, now we're changing the world daily. Like every day daily. something crazy happens in the world where people are doing things like the speed of change has been ridiculous. And we humans are not good at change. Like everybody 
everybody's bad at change. Like I don't, it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. hard. We want, we want stability. We want stability. We want the ability to have stable ground and a, and a flat, flat place. And I, I say this, that, um, people will find great solace in coming to a law firm that provides them a stable place that they feel like, okay, these people are keeping up with the change and they're, they're a rock of, of stability in a sea of change, right? So my goal is to utilize what's happening in AI and happening in, in the service industry um, and technology with the ability to give our clients a, a conduit to us that feels very stable and very forward thinking and allows them to do what they want to do, which it used to be everybody wanted to come into the office, Alex. Like I couldn't get somebody to sign a contract without coming. Look at the office. Behind I me. see the office in the background. Right. Yeah, it's I, a beautiful I have it office. In my background because I used to think the brick and mortar was so important. Like come to this big 10,000 square foot office and look at our courtroom and see our beautiful conference rooms. You've been in them, right? Like we I have pretty brick and mortar. Like, they're impressive. When you sit down, you're like, oh, these guys are real lawyers. Like yeah. this is it. You can't do this <laughs> unless you're a real lawyer. That's expensive. So we had that. And now no one wants to come to the office. Like literally getting a client to come to the office is like asking them to pull a tooth. You know, it's like, what do you want? It's like, can't you send me an electronic contract? Can't we yeah. have a Zoom conference right now? Can't we do it right now? Like yeah. right Can you now. Just do it, do it via text. Don't even talk to me. Right. <laughs> exactly. So we're we're developing those systems, right? And our goal is to be like, yes, we're here for you at every level. And we are right now creating a Lebovic app so that when you're a client you have this app direct connect into your case into your lawyer into your paralegal with a zoom connection with an ai interface so that you can get legal questions answered immediately and then check them with your lawyer and say hey the zoom robot says this what are we thinking blah 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 give you lots of access the traffic cameras the ability to tap into all the traffic cameras in florida and see if you can find your accident and get a picture of your like a lot of service, right? A lot of forward thinking capacity um, in a in a in a rock of stability that people now accept, which is this, right? Like everybody is all about their phones. So yeah. you got to do it on a smart device. You got to be able to do that interface on the smart device. We want to be able to show our clients, oh, just push the button on your phone, you know, the little electronic button, schedule a time. Push the button again. You're going to have a Zoom interface with your lawyer. People complain all the time. I can't get in touch with my lawyer. I can't get in touch with my lawyer because lawyers are busy, right? But now we've got the ability to say, okay, lawyers are busy, but they'll set out yeah. time for you. So everybody's You're going right. to have time set out, the ability to get with their clients, very fast communication, very clear communication. And, and that's what we're building for our client base. And I think that if people don't do that and create that model, that they're going to be left behind. The other good I, thing about my model is that we go to court and it's not going to, it's going to be a long time before they get rid of six human beings making decision with right. two teams of human beings fighting for their attention in a live action courtroom. And there's no way that this computer interface, because we tried it during COVID, does as good of a job for human beings as the in-person jury system. So I don't think we're getting rid of that. And as lawyers, we offer you that service and no one else can do that so we've got a good monopoly on that yeah no absolutely i mean to me it makes makes sense it's uh i had i interviewed another um uh, a thought leader in the ai space he's been around in ai since 2017 bill wong and you know he was at oracle dell like ibm some of the biggest ones so he's not just like ai from like a year or two ago and, right. uh, you know, he, he said, you know, what, what businesses need to do today in every area, every industry, whatever your position is, every, all your employees, but it starts with the company and the leadership like yourself, which clearly you're doing is you have to have an AI strategy, end of story. So here's the business strategy, right? Strategic goals, but then I have an AI strategy. So we talk about lead gen here and marketing. So I tell clients, you know, the, the, the marketers aren't getting replaced either, but it's the marketers who don't use AI who are going to get replaced. So lawyers as well. So what's your advice for an upcoming young lawyer who, you know, is trying to make a, a an impact in the industry and they're just starting out? Is it 
pay attention to AI or is it learn the, the core foundational um, strategies that made you successful? Brian, what, what advice would you give to a young lawyer? So my daughter just started law school. Oh, uh, okay. she's a, she's a first year at, at Miami. Congra and did congrats. Exceptionally well, I'm super braggy, braggy about it. Um, she had a great first semester. She works very hard um, and is a very bright young woman. And the advice that I continue to give to her, because people say, oh, she's going to join you guys. And I'm like, that is not the advice that I'm giving to my daughter. The advice that I'm giving to my daughter as a young lawyer is that the law is as broad a spectrum of possibility as you can imagine. Like, there's no end to the possibilities of what you can do in your career and make mm -hmm. an impact in the world through the legal degree. It, it, it has a credibility to it. It has a training to it. It has a thinking system to it. It has a knowledge base to it. It gives you an authority over a lot of people because of it. Um, and so the goal for, for me, for her, my, my hopeful goal for her is to find a true life mission. Like I feel like I found for myself mm -hmm. and to adapt to what the world is doing right after mm -hmm. finding what truly drives your passion. Like there are so many lawyers out there who do this and I, and I'm watching her, her friends do it. So she's got a group of very bright young women that she's befriended that she was her study group. We went out with them drinking last week and I asked them and they universally have told me that they're looking to get a job in the summer that'll pay them. And I'm like, okay, well, any, any job will pay you, right? Like, right. what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Like, what do you want to do? And they're like, I don't care. I just, I need a job, maybe in a big law firm. I don't care. I'll do property. I'll do real estate. I don't know enough about the law to, to know what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, I appreciate that. I mean, my daughter it went to law school late. As you know, she worked after she graduated college. So she had five years of working before she went back to law school. So maybe she's a little more... Um, developed in in herself and her kind of like direction in life where she's got some ideas on what she wants to do but even if you're young and you went right from law you know undergraduate to law school i think that you need to start to ask yourself some hard questions and be true to yourself and know who you are and what you want and then find that mission before you start to worry about ai or computers or any of that i think that this young generation is so fluent in the technology they're so natural in the way that they interface with the technology that, that it's not intimidating for them i don't think they're going to fall behind compared to people that kind of miss this rapid increase like i i see that if you're 30 let's say 32 or five years old like right in that gap 30 to 35 you're on the the back end of this rise of incredible um social engagement, mm -hmm. social connectivity that, I, I mean, I didn't have anything like it. I had a dial telephone attached to the wall growing up, right? Like <laughs> I had to memorize all my friends' numbers, 561-898-4201. Like everybody yeah. knows their, their their friends' phone numbers from childhood, which is probably a good memory device. But kids today, I mean, like they have a whole new set of things on their head and interfaces that they work with. And so if you're like 30 or younger, you're probably going to adapt really quickly to whatever comes at you. Well, you, you know what, Brian, I mean, I, I think you're a great example as far as, you know, leaders in business, that's what we're talking about, you know, of, of someone who doesn't allow their age to dictate the, you know, sort of their behavior or their stereotypes, you know, because I hear this so often with, with people my age and your age, that group, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too old to be on TikTok or learn this, you know, technology or that technology. I don't feel that way. And I know with you, um, you know, I, and I can really pick very few business leaders in our age categories who are like all in on technology, unless they're technologists, but I'm not talking about technologists. I'm talking about people who have different careers and say, Hey, you know what? I need to adapt. I need to know what's cutting edge innovation. You definitely embody that. So I think like uh, for anybody listening, you know, whatever your career or field is, it's important to stay up with the, the, the developments. And I just had a call yesterday, Brian, with someone who said, well, you know, I know you turned me on to chat GPT over a year ago and I had done all these keynote speeches um, uh, for nonprofit groups. And I said, guys, I mean, here I am a year later, Brian, we're talking about like 
Are you using this every day? Do you have an AI strategy? Not just chat GPT. And you're saying, well, you know, it was a year ago, but I still haven't gotten to it. Oh man, come on. It's like the world is moving very fast and you're allowing your age group to dictate your behavior and you're just becoming a stereotype. You certainly aren't that way at all. And so I, I, it's why I wanted to have you on the podcast because you're so forward thinking. And it's, I think, a, an inspiration to people out there who kind of say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm way too old now to be trying to learn what's new and, and just leave it to the younger people who I'm going to pay to do the job. But you get your hands dirty every day, Brian. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of vision, right? Like what's your vivid vision? There's a book called Vivid Vision that's spectacular out there by Cameron Harold. Um, I suggest that if you're at a place in your career where, you know, like there, there's that, there was that moment in my career when I was in my early fifties where my wife and I sat down and talked about, okay, what's our, what's our vision of like, what do we want in the future? Are we looking at retirement? Is this like, okay, we're going to get to a point and then we're going to peel back and we're going to enjoy, you know, our sixties and seventies as kind of less working people. And I, I intellectually came to the understanding that I would not be a happy person doing that. You know, okay. I would, I, I think that that's a, a recipe for disaster for me personally. Yeah. Some people would be great at it. Right. You're a lifelong learner. My wife, <laughs> my wife, Esther, my partner in the law firm, looks at that time period in her life as being extremely active in the public sector, doing, you know, work with charities, doing work with community service things. She's a she's an extremely community service driven, passionate person about that. So that's what drives her. You know, what drives me is building our business and envisioning the future and trying to figure out this technology piece and trying to figure out how we can become a much better entity and serve our community as a business entity. And so I'm driven by that, right? So we looked at ourselves and we were like, well, if we're, if we're there, right, and we know that that's what we want, let's mm -hmm. put it down on paper. Let's create a clear vision of where we're headed with the business, you know? And so that drives the thought of how you're going to deal with technology in the future. So that if your friends are, you know, like in their 40s or 50s and they're looking at this and saying, well, maybe I'll do it. So they're saying, all right, so I'm looking at my career path and I'm saying, maybe I don't know, maybe whatever. It's, I'll be okay. Like it's not going to outrun me, right? They may not be right. They may they may end up you know running into that wall that I said, but their vision is short, and so they're not doing anything about it. My vision is long, and so because the plan is long, I need to know today what's going to cause me to run behind in five years from now because I can't be left behind. So I'm 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 panicked. I'm driven, panicked, literally, always panicked. Right. Well, you know, you mentioned Esther, your partner, and of course, wife. And uh, I, I, I can't like finish today's podcast not talking about that piece of it because my wife and I, we've been in business together now since 2004. So we've worked all those years together. And it's something that I talk about typically um, on my other podcast, the Dadpreneur podcast. But if, for us, it's been great on, on every category, every level to be able to grow together and build a business. For you guys, that's been the case. I know you love, you know, riding your bike and boating and traveling and food. You like you you have so many passions, and you guys get to do that together and build yeah. this legacy, this business. So for for you, like for those out there who may be thinking, I, I want to go in business with my spouse because we both, you know, have similar talents or a dream of owning a business together. What what advice do you have? For them because you, you always hear the bad stories and here we are on the podcast both of us we have nothing but great things to say about it i think it's the greatest thing i've ever done i mean honestly um if you have the right teammate for you in life and that's what picking a spouse is about like picking the person who's going to be the best teammate for you and uh and i i got lucky and i and i found that i found that an extraordinary person um and, and, you know, like everybody's failable. We're all failable human beings, right? But she's the, the perfect complement to me as a person and has made me a much better person, right? In the world, a better leader, a better lawyer, a better father, um, and hopefully a, a better husband, I try. I don't know if she'll agree with that, but uh, <laughs> so, but, but I think that she would say the same of me and her duties as a business partner, as a lawyer, as a wife, as a mother, right? Like we complement each other. She's like, when you're crazy, I'm not crazy. Somehow I get this moment of stability. And 
when I'm crazy, you're not crazy. And you like, we, we balance each other. It comes from a lot of trust and love. Mm -hmm. It comes from the ability to be incredibly vulnerable and weak and know that that person isn't going to take advantage of that in any way that you can be that. Mm -hmm. And they'll be there for you to strengthen you, not hurt you. Mm -hmm. Um, communication and honest communication is really, really important. You know, like the ability to say when you're upset about things or yeah. and having tolerations and knowing the line, like Esther talks about deal breakers, right? Like we're going to get a divorce when you cross a deal breaker, right? Like, is this a deal breaker for me? And we've never done anything to each other that would ever be a deal breaker out of mutual respect, right? So, you know, like there's, there's just, it's just a good team. And when you have that- awesome. And it works that way. It just, it, it makes everything better and made the firm better. I think that people love it in the firm. And we just met another couple, interestingly enough, who is looking at their exit plan in the law. And they've been together since June, like almost junior high. He was in ninth grade. She was in 11th grade. She's two years older than him. And she asked him to the prom, right? And they've been together since then. Wow. And they're in their, they're in their mid sixties now. And they're looking at like, okay, what's our future now? We're probably, and they've been lawyers together. Like they've had the business together. They've worked together they're like the same identical path, but even longer than us, you know? So yeah, it's great to see. It, it's really inspiring. Definitely super inspiring. I admire that. Um, Brian, before we close out today, you know, I wanted to share with our audience here. We worked with you guys. We redesigned the website, worked with you on content, lead generation, you know, with in, in context of like, our relationship together from agency to advertiser, you guys being an advertiser, what, tell us about your experience working with predict. So I will tell you, I thought that predict was, and, and is one of the best sources of intelligentsia and understanding and creativity in the scheme of marketing groups that we've worked with over the years. And we've worked with a lot of different groups over the years. And, and I was so happy that Maria brought you to us when she did, um, you know, and, and in fact, Maria is not with us as you know, any longer, but I'm still super close with her. I, I still speak to her law, too. And I still talk to her. I talk to him. I talk to him more than her because yes. he and I are still friends. So it's, it's a great relationship. And I'm so happy that we still have this great relationship. And I know that, like we we've now tried to incorporate you guys into the foundation the foundation. Yes. You're doing great things there. So uh, the, the ability. Okay. So I'm going to give you a, for instance, we talked to an agency a while ago in the firm and we had them do a presentation for us and they came to us and it was all about them. It's, it was all about, this is what we do. This is what we do. And we do this great. And this is what we do great. And this is all we do great. Right. And at no time in that entire presentation, did they know or stop and ask or think about us as an entity, about what we needed, about what we thought we needed, about where we were in the world. Um, they even brought us creative because this was a, a television marketing agency, you know, so I'm talking about television marketing now. Um, they brought us creative and said, oh, look at this really amazing creative. And I think that if they would have seen our creative before they looked at their creative, they would have realized the inferior product that they were showing us. And, and so it was, it, it's that at a digital level, when talking with you guys, I predict you come in knowing what you know about the world, keeping up with the, the relentless innovation of the world, but coming and looking at us as the client and saying, we want to know you. We want to know what you guys need before we start making a plan about this is what you must do. We need to know your business. We want to listen to you, look at your data. We want to deep dive you as a client. We want to be a partner in your business. And that's that's amazing, right? Like that that is a business owner. I look at a, a company like that and think those are people worth partnering with because they're investing in my business, in me, and in our in our mission and what we're trying to do. And they want to truly understand us and what we do at our core value level and get to that. And I think that makes you extremely effective, more effective than almost anyone else I've met in the marketing field. Well, Brian, thank you again for sharing your journey, your insights with us, uh, to our listeners. If you're seeking a, a justice or, or, or just need a champion in your corner, reach out to the Lobovic Law Group. We're going to put the 
their contact information in the uh, show notes. Of course, we'll share it on social media. Um, and um, Brian, do you want to leave us with any any uh, positive words today? Uh, positive words today. Um, you're always you're always. I said Brian's always quick on his feet. He's always got something good to say. So um, you know, as you said, you know what? Right. Let's touch on that because so, you said there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. There is. You're right. Okay. So so I do. I'm gonna I'm gonna end on that. Cause that's, that's my positive thought today. Okay. Um, there's a guy named Darren Hardy, who's a pretty well-known kind of like uh guru. And I, and I get a, a message from him every day on, on, you know, like daily dose of positivity. Right. And the one that I heard recently that I really love, right. Is on recognizing the awe in the world around you and not letting people around you see the flaw, right? Don't worry so much about the flaw. Celebrate the awe and the wonder of the world around you. And I'll tell you the story that he told. Can I, do you have a minute for that? Or absolutely, have... absolutely. Okay, so here's here's the story. Young boy gets a, a hunting dog as a gift, a puppy hunting dog. And he's so proud of this hunting dog that he spends his entire summer training the dog and growing with the dog and becoming best buddies with the dog. And finally, when the dog's fully trained, he takes it out to go hunting and he, and he's laying in the bush and he does the duck call and lo and behold, some ducks fly and he shoots once, shoots twice, shoots three times, duck falls out of the sky into the middle of the pond. He gives a signal, the dog runs through the bushes, goes to retrieve the duck. And lo and behold, as the dog hits the water, he runs on top of the water and doesn't sink into the water picks the duck up off of it and runs back. And the boy thinks, it's a miracle dog. He doesn't even need to go swim. He can walk on water. This is the most amazing dog ever. So he he goes to the neighbor. He goes, no one's going to believe this. So he goes to his neighbor who he knows is a hunter. And he goes, hey, tomorrow, would you like to go hunting with me? And the neighbor says, sure, I'll go hunting with you. So they go hunting in the morning and they do the duck call, and lo and behold, the ducks come again, and they fly overhead, and he says to the hunter, he goes, you can go first, you're a better shot. One shot, duck falls out of the sky, right into the middle of the pond. Boy signals the dog. The dog pulls through the bushes, heads toward the water, and lo and behold, the dog walks on water again, runs out into the middle of the field, picks up the duck, and runs back, and drops the duck at their feet. And the boy looks at the guy, and the, the man looks at him and goes, your dog doesn't know how to swim? <laughs> Don't look some, for the, some some don't, people see things differently. Yes, don't look for the flaw. Recognize the wonder in the world around you. There's a lot of it, and it's a beautiful place. And don't get so caught up in the negative. That that is absolutely inspiring. Well, thanks again, Brian. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. That's Darren Hardy. If anybody wants to learn, but yeah, good stuff.